Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 120 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabolsky, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. Well, it's medieval story time again this week because I really like bringing primary sources to you when I can. And I was thinking last week about Sir Gawain and the Green Knight and some of the things I was saying about how you can combine this idea of a fairy other world with the Christianity of the Middle Ages and come up with a really great story. And so I was thinking about that in some of my favorite Arthurian romances and I thought I would bring to you one of those romances today. So there is a misconception that during the early Middle Ages, so the quote unquote dark ages, nobody actually read any classical literature from the ancient world. And that's actually not really true. People were still reading stuff from the ancient world, especially Aristotle in terms of natural history and Galen when it comes to medicine. And they really liked Ovid when it came to stories from mythology of the Greeks and Romans. And even though that didn't really sit well with the Christianity that most people in the Western part of Europe believed at the time, they were still great stories. People liked all these stories. And so they wanted to tell them in their own way. And one of these stories is, of course, the story of Orpheus and the underworld. And this is a story that people have loved for literally thousands of years. And it got retold in the Middle Ages under the name of Sir Orpheo. At least that was the name in Middle English. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Greek and Roman versions of the myth. And then I will read to you the entirety of Sir Orpheo, which will take up an entire podcast. But hope Hopefully you'll enjoy it because it's just a, it's a great story and it's interesting how these things play out. So if we talk about the Greek and Roman legend of Orpheus, who was he? What's the story? Well, Orpheus was a Thracian who was an amazing musician, a great singer, and a great player of the lyre. So he was able to charm birds and animals and people with his voice and with his playing. And it was just his magical gift, his gift from the gods, as it were. And he married a woman named Eurydice. But at the wedding, at least according to Ovid, and I'm going to stick to Ovid's version of the story because that's the one that seems to have informed the version that I'm going to be reading to you from the Middle Ages. According to Ovid, while they were getting married, Eurydice stepped on a snake and it bit her ankle and killed her. So Orpheus mourns for a little while and then he decides he's going to head down to the underworld and ask to have her back. So he goes to the underworld and he sings and everybody stops to take note. He makes Persephone cry. Tantalus stops thinking about how he wants water. Sisyphus stops rolling that stone upwards. And even the Furies are said to have wept at Orpheus' story of, of losing Eurydice right as they are newlyweds. And so there is this deal struck so that... Orpheus can take Eurydice back with him to the regular world, to the human world, as long as when he's taking her up there, while he's walking up there, he doesn't look back at her. So he's following the path out of the underworld and he's thinking hard about how she should be behind him, but maybe she's not behind him, but gods are not very nice and maybe they're tricking him. So is she actually behind him or not? And sure enough, they are steps from the light. They're moments from the goal. And Orpheus looks back and of course Eurydice disappears and she goes back to the underworld. And in the story, Ovid's story, she forgives him, of course, because he at least tried. <laughs> I don't know if I'd be as forgiving is Eurydice, but maybe that's why I haven't made it into mythology yet. <laughs> so after that, Orpheus sits on the side of the sticks for a week and he's disheveled and he's unkempt and he's not eating. And then he finally realizes it's no use. After three years, it said he doesn't have any interest in women anymore, but he brings the tradition to Thrace of instead sleeping with young boys, which of course is disturbing to us, but it wasn't as disturbing to the ancients. I'm mentioning this because you'll find no trace of it in the medieval version of it, even though it's in the original source material. So what happens to Orpheus? Well, everyone still loves him. So one day he wanders across the followers of Dionysus, the Minads, who are women who, when they have the frenzy of Dionysus on them, are unstoppable kind of rage machines. And they realize that Orpheus is there, but he will never sleep with them. So they get pretty upset about that. And they start throwing rocks and stones and branches at him. But none of these things actually hit Orpheus because his singing is so sweet and nature will just not harm him because of this music. 
music. So instead, the Maenads chase away some farmers who see them coming and quite rightly run away. And they take the farm implements, which of course are not from nature, they're made by man, and they use those to kill Orpheus. And he is able to reunite with Eurydice in the underworld. Dionysus is not a big fan of this himself, and so he takes revenge on the Maenads by turning them all into trees. So that is the Greek and Roman story of Orpheus, as told by Ovid. And now we'll get into the version of it that was told in Middle English. I'm going to be giving you a translation that's from 1914. The reason that I use translations that are a bit older and actually sound a bit older is not because I'm trying to give you ye olde feel of anything, but more that I'm trying to respect the rights of translators. And so I don't want to use a new translation that is copyrighted belonging to somebody. So these ones are out of copyright. When I do medieval story time, I tend to use versions and translations that are out of copyright. So they tend to be over 100 years old, like this one. And of course, I'll give you the link to this translation in the show notes. So here we go. Here is the version of Sir Orfeo as told in medieval England. We read full oft and find it writ as ancient clerks give us to wit the lays that harpers sung of old, of many a diverse matter told. Some sang of bliss, some heaviness, and some of joy and gladsomeness, of treason some, and some of guile, of happening strange that chanced a while, of knightly deeds, of ribaldry, and some they tell of fairy. But of all the themes that men approve, methinks the most they be of love. In Britain first these lays were wrought, there were they made and thence were brought. They told adventurous deeds and days, whereof the Britons made their lays. For, and they heard a story told, of wondrous hat that chanced of old, they took their harp without in fail, made them a lay, and named the tale. And of the deeds that thus befell, a part, not all, is mine to tell. So hearken, lordings, true and leal, the tale of Orpheo's woe and weal. This Orpheo he was king with crown, a mighty lord of high renown, a stalwart man and hardy too, courteous and free of hand also. His parents might their lineage trace to Pluto and to Juno's race, who for their marvels manifold were held as gods in days of old. Now chief of all the arts that be, Sir Orpheo loved good minstrelsy. He honored much the harper's skill and harbored them of right good will. Himself upon the harp would play and set thereto his mind alway, till such his skill that far or near no better harper might ye hear. For never a man of woman born, although for sorrow all forlorn, but and he heard Sir Orpheo play, forgot his heaviness straight away, and deemed himself in paradise for joy of such sweet melodies. In Tracians Orpheo held his court, a city strong, a goodly fort, and with him reigned his queen so fair, Dame Eurydice, beyond compare. The fairest lady, so I read, that ever wear this mortal weed, so full of love and gentleness that none might tell her goodliness. It was the coming in of May, when gay and gladsome is the day, banish the chilly winter showers, and every field is full of flowers, when blossoms deck the bough so green, and every heart is glad, I ween, that Eurydice, the queen, was fain to take unto her maidens twain, and go forth on a morning tide, for pastime, to an orchard side, to hear the birds sing loud and low, and watch the blossoms bud and blow. And there they sat them down all three, beneath a spreading elder tree, and as they sat in shadows green, a slumber deep o'ertook the queen. That sleep her maidens dare not break, but let her lie, nor bade her wake, and so she slept the morning through, until the day to even drew. But when she woke, ah me, the change! Strange were her words, her actions strange. She wrung her hands and tore her face till that the blood ran down apace. Her goodly robes she soon had torn, as if of sense she were forlorn. Affrighted were those maidens twain. Back to the hall they ran amain, and of their lady's woeful plight they told each gallant squire and knight an aid to hold the queen they sought, for sure they deemed her all distraught. 
Forth run the knights, the ladies run, full sixty maids if ever a one. Swift to the orchard shade they hie, and take the queen up speedily. They bear her to her couch at last, and there by force they hold her fast. But she crieth what no man understands, and will up and away from their holding hands. Straight to the king they brought the word, t'was the sorriest tidings he ever heard. Ten of his knights he called that hour, and gat him to his lady's bower. He looked on the queen right woefully, and spake, Sweetheart, what aileth thee? Wast ever wont to be so still, and now thou criest wondrous shrill. Thy flesh, but now so soft and white, hast torn with thy nails a doleful sight. Thy face, this morn so rosy red, is pale and wan as thou wert dead. Alack and alas for thy fingers small, bloody they are and white withal. In thine eyes so lovesome and shining clear are e'en as a man's whose foe draws near. Sweetheart, I prithee, hear my plaint. Cease for a while thy sore complaint, and say who hath wronged thee, when and how, and if never a man may help thee now. Still was the queen for a little space, while the bitter tears they flowed apace, and she spake to the king with voice so drear, Alas, Sir Orfeo, Lord most dear, since first the day we wed were fain, no word of wrath chanced between us twain. But I, thy wife, have loved thee, e'en as my life as thou hast me. But now must we part, ah, oh, woe the day! Do what thou wilt, for I must away. Alack, quoth the king, forlorn am I. Where goest thou, sweeting, to whom and why? Whither thou goest, I go with thee, and where I may be, shalt thou bide with me. Nay, sir, nay, tis an empty word, for hearken and hear what hath chanced, my lord. As I lay but now by our orchard side, and slumbered away the morning tide, there came two gentle knights to me, armed at all points, as knights should be, and bade me come, nor make delay, to speak with their lord the king straightway. But I answered back in queenly mood, I might not, and would not, if I could. They turned them about, and fled amain, and swift came the king with all his train. A hundred knights, I wis, had he, and a hundred maidens fair to see, and each one rode on a snow-white steed, and each was clad in a snow-white weed. Of all the folk that mine eyes have seen, they were the fairest folk, I ween. The king wear a crown upon his head, but it was not wrought of gold so red, nor of silver, but eke of a precious stone, bright as the noonday sun it shone. And e'en as he came without yea or nay, needs I must ride with him straightway, and I would or no I must with him ride. He gave me a palfrey by his side, and he brought me unto his palace fair, builded and garnished beyond compare. He showed me castles and goodly towers, rivers and forests, meads with flowers, and many a goodly steed and tall. Then he turned again from his castle hall, and brought me back to my orchard tree, and spake in such wise as I tell to thee. Lady, tomorrow I bid thee be here on this spot neath this elder tree. Hence shalt thou ride with me away, to dwell at my court for ever and I. And if thou delayest to do my will, or here or there it shall be thine ill, for no man may help thee or hold thee now, did they tear thee limb from limb, I trow. For living or dying, or whole or torn, must thou ride with us tomorrow's morn. Alas, cried the king, now woe is me, in sorry case methinks we be. For liever were I to lose my life than thus to be robbed of my queen, my wife. Counsel he craveth in this need, but no man knoweth a fitting reed. Tis the morrow's dawn, and with courage high, Sir Orfeo arms him fittingly, and full a thousand knights with him are girded for combat stout and grim. Forth with the queen they now will ride to the elder tree by the orchard side, and there in its shadow they take their stand and a shield wall build on either hand, and each man sweareth he here will stay and die ere his queen be reft away. Yet e'en as their lips might form the vow, the queen was gone, and no man knew how. For the fairy folk they have cast their spell, and whither they bear her no man may tell. Oh, then there was wailing, I ween, and woe. To his chamber straight the king doth go, and he casteth him down on the floor of stone, and he maketh such dole and such bitter moan, that well nigh he wept his life away. But counsel or aid there was none that day. Then he bade his men come, one and all, earls, barons, and knights, to his council hall, 
and they came, and he spake, My lord so dear, I take ye to witness before me here, that I give my high steward and seneschal, the rule of my lands and kingdoms all. I will have him stay in this my stead, and rule the land, e'en as I were dead. For since I have lost my wife, the queen, the fairest lady this earth hath seen, to dwell in the wilderness I am fain, and look on no woman's face again but to spend my days for evermore with the beasts of the field in the woodland hoar. And when ye know that my days be done, then come ye together, every one, and choose you a king. Now I go my way. Deal with my goods as best ye may. Then a voice of weeping rose in the hall, and a bitter cry from one and all. Scarce might they speak, or old or young, for fast-flowing tears that chained their tongue. But they fell on their knees with one accord, and they prayed, and so it might please their lord, that he should not thus from his kingdom go. Go to, he quoth, it must needs be so. Thus Sir Orfeo forth would fare, only a staff in his hand he bare, neither kirtle he took nor hood, shirt nor other vesture good, but alway he took his harp in hand, and gat him barefoot out of the land. Never a man might with him go. Alack, there was weeping, I ween, and woe, when he who aforetime was king with crown passed as a beggar out of the town. By woodland and moorland the king hath passed, to the wilderness he is come at last. There findeth he not that his soul may please, but ever he liveth in great misease. He that was wrapped in fur withal, and slumbered soft neath purple and pall, on the heather he now must rest his head, with leaves and grass for a covering spread. He that had castles, hulls with towers, rivers, forests, fields with flowers, must make his bed neath the open sky, though it snow and freeze right piercingly. Once knights and ladies a goodly train to do him service were ever fain. Now none in waiting to please the king, but the worms of the woodland coil and spring. He that erstwhile might take his fill of food or drink as should be his will. Now must he dig and delve all day for the roots that may scarce his hunger stay. In summertime hath he fruit to eat, the hedgerow berries sour and sweet, but in winter he liveth in sore misease on roots and grasses and bark of trees, till all his body was parched and dry and his limbs were twisted all awry. Dear Lord, who may tell what sorrow sore, Sir Orfeo suffered ten year and more. His beard, once black, is grey, I trow, to his girdle clasp it hangeth low. His harp, which was wont to be his glee, he keepeth safe in a hollow tree. And when the sun shone bright again, to take that harp he aye was fain, and to temper the chords as should seem him good, till the music rang through the silent wood, and all the beasts that in woodland dwell, for very joy at his feet they fell. And all the birds in the forest free were fain to seek the nearest tree, and there on the branch they sat a row, to hearken the melody sweet and low. But when his harp he had laid aside, nor beast nor bird would with him abide. Oft times I ween in the morning bright, Sir Orfeo saw a fairer sight, for he saw the king of the fairies ride, a hunting down by the forest side, with merry shout and the horn's gay blast, and the bay of the hounds the hunt swept past. But never the quarry they ran to bay, and he knew not whither they went all way. In other fashion he'd come again with a warlike host in his royal train, full thousand riders richly dight, each armed as becometh a valiant knight, of steadfast countenance tried and true, Full many a banner above them flew, as they rode with drawn sword on warfare bent, but never he wist the way they went. And then they would come in other guise, knights and ladies in joyous wise, in quaint attire as of days gone by, pacing a measure soberly, to sound of tabor and pipe they pass, making sweet music across the grass. Again it chanced that he saw one day sixty ladies who rode their way, Gracious and gay is the bird on the tree, and never a knight in that company. Falcon on hand those ladies ride, on hawking bent by the riverside. Full well they know it as right good haunt, of mallard, of heron, and cormorant. 
But now hath the waterfowl taken flight, and each falcon chooseth his prey aright, and never a one but hath slain its bird. Then Sir Orfeo, laughing, spake this word, By faith, but those folk have a goodly game. I will get me thither in heaven's name. Of old I was wont such sport to see. Thus he came to that goodly company, and stayed his steps by a lady fair. He looked on her face and was well aware, by all the tokens of truth, I ween, that was Eurydice, his own sweet queen. Each on the other to gaze was fain, yet never a word passed betwixt the twain. But at sight of her lord in his sorry plight, who aforetime had been so fair a knight, the tears welled forth and flowed amain. Then the ladies round they seized her rein, by force must she ride with them away, for with her lord might she longer stay. Alack, quoth the king, woe worth the day, thou sluggard death, why make delay? O wretched me that I live, I ween, after the sight that mine eyes have seen. Alas, that I needs must live my life, when I may not speak with my love, my wife, and she dare not speak to her lord so true. Now break my heart for ruth and rue. If faith, he quoth, whate'er be tied, whithersoe'er those ladies ride, that selfsame way shall my footsteps fare, for life or death I have little care. Then with staff in hand and harp on back, he gat him forth on the toilsome track, nor for stock nor for stone will he hold him still, but goeth his way of right good will. Through a cleft in the rock lies the fairy way, and the king he follows as best he may, through the heart of the rock he needs must go, three miles and more I would have ye know, till a country fair before him lay, bright with the sun of a summer's day. Nor hill nor valley might there be seen, but level lands and pastures green, and the towers of a castle met his eye, rich and royal and wondrous high. The outer wall of that burg, I ween, was clear and shining as crystal sheen, and a hundred towers stood round about, of cunning fashion and building stout. Up from the moat sprang the buttress bold, arched and fashioned of good red gold. The castle front was of carven stone, all manner of beast might ye see thereon, and the dwelling rooms within that hall, of precious stones were fashioned all. The meanest pillar ye might behold was covered all over with burnished gold. Throughout that country t'was ever light, for e'en when the hour was murk midnight, those goodly jewels they shone, each one, bright as at midday the summer sun. T'was past all speech and beyond all thought, the wondrous work that there was wrought. Sir Orfeo deemed that at last his eyes beheld the proud palace of paradise. In at the gate rode the fairy train, and the king to follow them was full fain. He knocketh loud at the portal high, and the warder cometh speedily. He asketh him where he fain would go. A harper am I, quoth Sir Orfeo, and methinks and thy lord would hearken me. I would solace his hours with minstrelsy. With that the porter made no ado, but gladly he let Sir Orfeo through. The king looked round him to left to right, and in sooth he beheld a fearsome sight. For here lay folk whom men mourned as dead, who were hither brought when their lives were sped. E'en as they passed, so he saw them stand, headless and limbless on either hand. There were bodies pierced by a javelin cast. There were raving madmen fettered fast. One sat erect on his warhorse good. Another lay choked as he ate his food. Some floated, drowned in the water's flow. Shriveled were some in the flame's fierce glow. There were those who in childbed had lost their life, some as leaven and some as wife. Men and women on every side lay as they slept at slumber tide. Each in such fashion as he might see had been carried from earth to fairy. And her whom he loved beyond his life, Dame Huridus, his own sweet wife, he saw asleep neath an elder tree and knew by her raiment that it was she. He looked his fill on these marvels all, and went his way to a kingly hall, and he saw therein a goodly sight. Beneath a canopy rich and bright, the king of the fairies had his seat, with his queen beside him, fair and sweet. Their crowns, their vesture agleam with gold, his eyes might scarcely the sight behold. Sir Orfeo gazed for a little space, then he kneeled on his knees before the dais. O king, he said, and it were thy will, 
as minstrel I gladly would show my skill. And the king, he quoth, Who mayest thou be, who thus unbidden hast come to me? I call thee not unto this my court, no man of mine hath thee hither brought. For never I ween since my reign began have I found so foolish and fay a man who found his way unto this my home, save that I bade him hither come. Lord, quoth Sir Orfeo, know for sure that I am not but a minstrel poor, and e'en as the minstrel's manner is, I seek out castles and palaces. Though never a welcome our portion be, yet needs must we proffer our minstrelsy. Then he took his harp so sweet of tone, and he sat him down before the throne, and he tuned the strings as well he knew, and so sweet were the sounds that he from them drew, that no man within the palace bound, but sped swift foot as he heard the sound, and down they lie around his feet. The melody seemeth to them so sweet. The king he hearkens and holds him still, hearing the music of right good will, and the gentle queen she was glad and gay, such comfort was theirs from the minstrel's lay. When he had finished his minstrelsy, out spake the monarch of fairy. Harper, right well hast thou played, I trow. Whatever thou wilt, thou mayst ask me now. I am minded in royal wise to pay. So what is thy will now, Harper? Say. Quoth Sir Orfeo, sire, I would pray of thee one thing alone that thou give to me, that lady fair who is sleeping now beneath the shade of the elder bough. Nay, quoth the king, twere an ill-matched pair did I send thee forth with that dame so fair, for never a charm doth the lady lack, and thou art withered and lean and black. Twere a loathly thing, it seemeth me, to send her forth in such company. Sire, quoth Sir Orfeo, gentle king, to my mind it seemeth a fouler thing to belie a word and forswear an oath. Sire, thou didst promise nothing loath that that which I asked I should have of thee, and that promise thou needs must keep to me. Then spake the king, Since the thing be so, take that lady fair by her hand and go, and may bliss and blessing with ye dwell. Then he kneeled adown and thanked him well. Sir Orfeo took his wife by the hand, and he gat him swift from the fairy land. Out of the palace he took his way, by the selfsame road he had come that day, and never he stayed till again he stood before the walls of that city good, where aforetime as king he wear the crown. But no man knew him in all that town. But a little way from the gate they go, ere they come to a dwelling poor and low, and Sir Orfeo deemed they would harbor there, for more would he know ere he'd further fare. So he prayed as a minstrel wan and worn, they would shelter him and his wife till morn. Then he asked his host who was ruler there, and who was king of that country fair, and the beggar answered him word for word, and told him the tale, as ye have heard, how ten years agone in the month of May their queen was by fairy stolen away, and in exile their king had wandered forth, but none knew whither or south or north, and the stewards since the land did hold, and many another tale he told. When the morrow came and t'was high noontide, the king bade his wife in the hut abide, and he clad himself in the beggar's gown, and harp in hand he sought the town, and he gat him into that city good, that all men might see him and they would. Earl and baron and lady bright stared agape at the wondrous sight. Was ever, they cried, such marvel known, that man is by hair as by moss o'ergrown. Look how his beard hangeth to his knee, tis e'en as he were a walking tree. Then as to the palace his way was set, in the city street the steward he met, and he cried aloud, Sir steward, I pray that thou have mercy on me this day. I am a harper of heathenness, help me in this my sore distress. And the steward, he quoth, Now come with me, all that I have I will share with thee. Every good harper is welcome here, for Sir Orfeo's sake, my lord most dear. The steward, he sat him down at the board, with many a noble knight and lord. All kinds of music had they, I trow, a trumpet and tabor and harp enow. In the hall was no lack of melody. Sir Orfeo hearkened silently, until all had done he held him still, then he took and tempered his harp with skill, and I think me no tongue of man may say how sweet was the music he made that day. 
To hearken and hear was each one fain, but the steward he gazed on the harp again, and it seemed to him that he knew it well. Minstrel, he quoth, I beseech thee tell, whence hadst thou that harp, and who gave it thee? I pray that thou truly answer me. Lord, he quoth, afar from here, as I took my way through a desert drear, I found in a valley dark and grim a man by lions torn limb from limb. Wolves gnawed his bones with teeth so sharp, and beside the body I found this harp. Full ten years ago it needs must be. Alas, cried the steward, now woe is me. T'was the course of my lord Sir Orfeo. Ah, wretched me, what shall I do? Of so good a lord I am left forlorn. Methinks twere best I had never been born. Ah, woe that for him such lot was cast, and so foul a death he must die at last. With that the steward he swooning fell, but the lords they comforted him right well. For no man so sad who draweth breath, but findeth healing at last in death. By all these tokens Sir Orfeo knew a loyal man was his steward and true, one who loved his lord nor his pledge would break. Then up he stood, and on this wise spake, Hearken, I pray thee, steward, my word. Put case I were Orfeo now, thy lord. Say I had suffered torment sore in the wilderness full ten years and more, that at last I had won my queen away from the land where the fairy king holds sway, and that we had safely come, we twain, back to this city and burg again, and my wife abode with a beggar poor, while I came again to my palace door in lowly guise thus to test thee still, and see if thou bore me right good will. I wot, and I found thee so leal and true, my coming again thou shouldst never rue. Verily and indeed without yea or nay, the throne should be thine when I passed away. But if news of my death had been joy to thee, thou hadst passed from this house right speedily. Then never a man at the castle board but knew this was indeed their lord. The steward right well his master knew. Over and over the board he threw, and lo, at Sir Orfeo's feet would fall, and so do the lordings, one and all. And they cry with one voice till the rafters ring, Thou art our lord, sire, and our king. Lithe of his coming they were, and gay. To his chamber they led the king straightway, and they bathed him well, and trimmed his hair, and clad him in royal raiment fair. And then with solemn and stately train, they brought the queen to her burg again, with all manner of music and minstrelsy, if faith there was joyous melody. And the tears of joy they fell like rain, when the folk saw their king and queen again. Now is Orfeo crowned once more, I wis, with his lady and queen, Dame Hurridus, and many a year they lived those two, and after them ruled the steward so true. Harpers in Britain, as I was told, heard how this marvel had chanced of old, and thereof they made a lay so sweet, and gave it the king's name, as was meet. Sir Orfeo, thus the title stood, good are the words, the music good. Thus came Sir Orfeo out of his care, God grant to us all as well to fare. So there you have it, the story of Sir Orfeo, otherwise known as Orpheus in his Greek and Roman traditions. And I hope you liked it. I wanted to bring this one to you for a bunch of reasons. First of all, it's a classic of medieval romance. So it's one that you come across all the time. One that I think people who are studying medieval romance always come across. So there's that. But there's also a whole bunch of other things that I think are interesting. So I talked about how this is an ancient story. And I bet you noticed a bunch of things that show how this story was adapted to suit a new audience in a Christianized medieval Europe. So what are some of the ways that they did that? Well, one of the ways that I think is really interesting is right at the beginning, you hear that Orpheus is descended from Pluto and Juno, who the narrator tells us were people who were thought of as gods back in the day, but they weren't really gods. So it's okay to tell this story because it's just about people who were misguidedly thought of as gods at the time, but not actually gods. So it doesn't conflict with Christianity in that way. So they've got that as a way around it. You also hear references to paradise, references to heaven. There's references to God at the end, of course, which is the narrator who is asking for a blessing on us all, which is really conventional at the end of something like a medieval romance. But there are some other ways that they make this medieval 
in a way that works with the culture of the time and with the tradition in which these stories were told. And one of the big ways they do that is by changing the underworld into the very other world. So while you can't really talk about gods as being real, you can at this time talk about fairies as being real, which is interesting, I think. It's not in conflict with Christianity as much as people have thought in the past. There's a lot of room and flexibility for Christianity to accept these ideas of a fairy other world, and you see them all over the place. For example, King Arthur is always the most Christian king, and yet, and yet he's got a, a very magical past. He's got a magical sister. He's got Merlin. He's got all these things going on in the background, as do his knights. And if you're listening last week, you heard about Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Again, a story with a lot of magic in the middle of it. So interestingly, the underworld gets shifted to the other world, but it takes with it a lot of its ancient characteristics. So you see all these people as they were when they died. This is not something that you see very often in the fairy other world in other stories. So it's really, really a borrowing from Ovid's Metamorphoses. And instead of having Tantalus, for example, or Sisyphus, you have people who are just as they died. So you heard all the gross ways that people can die in the Middle Ages. That's how they're stuck in the other world. And you'll notice that the author doesn't take the time to bother to explain that. How they end up there? Why are they not in hell? Is this actually hell? They don't bother to explain that. They often don't in medieval romance. But it's a way of adapting these old stories, these ancient stories, and making them fit into the culture of the time. One of the interesting things about the fairy other world in this version of the story is that it's not like the underworld. Everything is beautiful and made of precious materials and gold. And there's a certain amount of temptation attached to that. In the Middle Ages, of course, you don't want to be avaricious or greedy. You don't want to be seen to be grasping at things like precious gold and jewels and things like that. But at the same time, Many ideas of heaven involve these precious gems. So it's kind of interesting the fairy other world in this story has this mixture of the beauty, the most beautiful things that can be associated with heaven at this time, as well as the people who are in the th gruesome throes of death as they might be in visions of hell at the time. So it's a really interesting poem in that it brings these things together into the fairy other world. The fairies are always both benevolent and malevolent at the same time. And that's what makes them unpredictable and also always great characters in a story. Another one of the borrowings is that Eurydice's name becomes Eurydice and it's almost like somebody saw Eurydice written out and then sounded it out in Middle English and made that into Eurydice. So it's it's interesting because if you look at Eurydice's name in English, you really want to pronounce it as Eurydice or Eurydice, Eurydice, something like that. So it's interesting that it's been switched into Middle English as Eurydice. And it's notable that her name is kept because in a lot of medieval romances, the women don't have names and they don't have a lot of agency. In Ovid's story, Eurydice doesn't have a lot of agency either, but in this story she has, in Sir Orpheo, she has a voice, which is interesting as well. She has a, a fully formed character, at least more than in many other romances. Then there's a lot of things that are really classically medieval romance here. And one of the ones that is most interesting to me is the fact that she's kidnapped by the fairies, when she falls asleep under a tree. And the more romances you read, the more you know that it's a really bad idea to fall asleep under a tree, especially a grafted tree. But in this case, it's just an elder tree. Don't fall asleep under a tree or you're going to get yourself in trouble, especially in May. And May is a time of all sorts of adventures, especially in Arthurian literature and chivalric literature. May is a time when things happen. It could be in part because May is a time when people start to gear up for war because the weather is better. But it's also a magical time because this is when spring is erupting. And it's a very, it's a magical time. It's a time of potential. And it's been that way. It's been seen that way forever. Again, if you think back to ancient sources, this idea of a rebirth is a great time for adventuring when it comes to medieval romance. 
So I hope you enjoyed Sir Orfeo. It's a great story. It's got everything you could ask for from a medieval romance. This translation was by Jesse L. Weston in The Chief Middle English Poets, which is a book from 1914. But luckily for you, we will have a hyperlink for you to chase this translation down if you so wish. We'll also have a link for you to see the poem in its original Middle English. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's new, Peter? Hey, hey. Well, we're welcoming back uh, Kate Stevens as one of our columnists. She just has a book about to come out. It's called How to Slay a Dragon, a fantasy hero's guide to the real Middle Ages. It's coming out later this month. Now she's got some time to write for us. And so the first piece is how medieval children got their names. Ooh. Yeah. So we have that. And we're kind of sticking with the kids theme this weekend. Catherine Waltons has a piece on how medieval parents taught manners to their children. Like, you know, uh, no wrestling with dogs, be attentive at the table, all that kind of fun stuff, right? All the same type of stuff we're saying today. <laughs> In, indeed, it is very much the same. Oh, <laughs> no throwing sticks. Exactly. Um, Don't throw a stick at your sibling. So we have all that good stuff and more on the site this week. Sounds great. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. Thank you, as always, to our patrons on Patreon.com for all your support. Patrons of the Medieval Podcast can choose from all sorts of awesome stuff like subscriptions to Medieval Warfare magazine and the Medieval magazine, membership in our book club, and our exclusive maps by Tina Ross. To find out how to become a patron of the Medieval Podcast, please visit Patreon.com slash Medievalists. For everything from childhood to changelings, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalist. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, all over social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite online bookstores, where you can even pre-order the new one, How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life, which comes out in October. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Gee Frog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself a wonderful day. Bye.